is critical of the, drone, or the US's use of drones in Afghanistan and Pakistan following September 11th, 2001. Ms. Benjamin has also been on a number of, spoken out, sorry, on another, a n number of other issues such as major corporate bans, unfair treatment of sweatshop workers, and finding a humane resolution for the ongoing Israel-Palestine conflict. In the 1990s, she was a key player in securing $20 million from 27 major U.S. clothing retailers for those companies' sweatshop laborers. Um, Ms. Benjamin attended a pro-democracy demonstration in both Egypt and, and Bahrain during the Arab Spring and organized 2010's Gaza Freedom March um, in opposing, opposition to APAC policies. She has worked to hold President Obama accountable, not only for controversial drone policies, but also the holding of supposed threats to US security in Guantanamo Bay to Cuba. A former Green Party candidate for the California Senate, Ms. Benjamin has won global recognition and was selected along with a number of other hardworking female activists to accept the Nobel Peace Prize on behalf of women working for peace worldwide. Now, I would like to ask you to please join me in welcoming Medea Benjamin. I was just thinking, looking at this wonderful line of women, that if you all were the Security Council of the United Nations, we would have a very different world today. Okay. A much better one. Um, I'm going to ask a question that's probably uh, not asked often, but and don't answer it if you don't feel comfortable doing it. But I'm just kind of curious about who you all are. So if you don't mind, um, Raising your hand if you consider yourself more aligned with the Republican Party. Raise your hand if you consider yourself more aligned with the Democratic Party. Raise your hand if you consider yourself an independent. Wow, that's most of you. Which is now actually the majority of Americans. Uh, and if you, how about Green Party? <laughs> person here. Uh, another party that I didn't mention? Libertarian. Libertarian. Oh, sorry, of course I should mention. Libertarian. Almost. Uh, I'm actually surprised there's not more of you Libertarian. Um, yes. Socialist. Socialist. You better not be raising your own hand. Ah, okay. All right. And I didn't look at all of you, but... Um, it's so we're a mixed crowd here, which is good. And I want to talk about policies mostly post 9-11. And sometimes when I talk, people think, oh, she's like anti-Bush or she's anti-Obama. And I just wanted to, to sort of lay the groundwork that it's not that I'm anti-anybody. Uh, it's I'm, that I'm pro-human rights, pro-democracy, and pro-diplomacy. And that's, you can clap for that, because that's what you're all <laughs> And I think it's great that you do this model UN under this rubric of diplomacy, because diplomacy is something that we put aside post 9-11, and it's high time that it comes back to the top of the agenda. So I was outside, um, well, at American, I lived in Washington, D.C., and at American University uh, yesterday, there was a talk by Dick Cheney. Any groans? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you Republicans. Um, but uh, I thought that American University, very liberal school, Dick Cheney would come in and there would be a lot of groans. And a lot of people unhappy that Dick Cheney had been invited to speak at American. And you know, when you get these high-powered people, your university is paying big bucks to get them. Like Condoleezza Rice, who got is getting $150,000 to speak at University of Michigan. Uh, and uh, I don't know how much Dick Cheney got. But anyway, so the students came in, and before he even started speaking, they gave him a standing ovation. No groans? <laughs> well, I thought that was kind of weird, because if you look at Dick Cheney's record, uh, Dick Cheney, George Bush, Condoleezza Rice, Donald Rumsfeld, they lied us into a war. And I'm afraid that your generation doesn't really realize how awful that was, and how awful it is what we did to Iraq. And it was just the 11th anniversary of the invasion of Iraq. 
And I went to Iraq under the dictatorship of Saddam Hussein. I don't say that with any picnic having Saddam Hussein. But Iraq is so much worse off today than it was before the US invaded. And when you think of these last 12 years now, invasion of Iraq, invasion of Afghanistan, the countless numbers of people that are dead in those countries because of our invasion, the over 6,000 Americans who are dead for what? Because, come on, if anybody wants to tell me that we won something in Iraq or Afghanistan, we can have a good discussion about that one. And then to think of the trillions of dollars that was robbed from our treasury, and really robbed from your future. And it's part of the reason why college education isn't affordable in this country. It's part of the reason that we don't have a decent health care system. Even with Obamacare, that's not a decent health care system. And you look at health care systems in other countries, it's a single payer system with decent health care for everybody, cutting out the insurance companies, which saves you a lot of money. And when you look at why we don't have a, a decent transportation system in this country, or the infrastructure crumbling, just going through the town of Springfield and Holyoke, you know, why we don't have a vibrant manufacturing sector is a lot of it because we are spending over 50% of our discretionary funds on the military. And we spent trillions of dollars on two wars that brought us nothing but death and destruction. So when somebody like Dick Cheney or George Bush or Condoleezza Rice or Rumsfeld come to speak at one of your universities, I hope you will stand up and speak out about what they did. And not only was it the wars, but it's also the torture. I mean, we're fighting right now in Congress, and my group, Code Pink, is part of that, to get the torture papers, the report that was done by the Senate Intelligence Committee, released to the public, because we think it's high time that we learned what our government did in our name. And so far, we still have not been able to get those papers released. And I look at what's happening today, like the Russian uh, takeover of Crimea. And other people in the world say, well, who is the US to criticize what Russia did when you invaded and occupied Iraq that had nothing to do with 9-11? Or I and my two of my colleagues right here just returned from Egypt, where on our way into the country, I was held for 17 hours and then beaten up and treated terribly. And while I was being mistreated by these terrible Egyptian police, they said, look what your country does in Guantanamo. So we have lost our moral authority by what we have been doing. So I look at what happened under the Bush administration and Obama came in and there was a lot of hope that things were gonna change. But one of the worst things Obama did was say, I'm not gonna look backwards, we're gonna look forward. If you don't look backwards, you can't move forward in the right direction. If you don't look backwards and say, how did we get involved in a war in Iraq that had nothing to do with 9-11? Who is responsible for the lies that we're told? If we don't look back and say, who was responsible for torture, extraordinary rendition, indefinite detention, things that should go against our values as Americans, you know what happens? A lot of those policies get continued. And that's exactly what has been happening under the Obama administration. Has Guantanamo prison been closed? No. Anybody know? <laughs> no, it hasn't been closed. And what Obama has been doing with the drone has been worse, actually, than happened under the Bush administration. Now, I'm going to go quickly through this talk about drones because I don't have a lot of time. But I'm not talking about drones that are cool and fun and might deliver your Amazon packages to you or your pizza or might take pictures of you on the ski slopes. There's a lot of cool uses of drones, potentially. I'm talking about the drones that are used to kill people. The drones where the pilots are based here in the United States in air-conditioned rooms and ergonomic chairs, not putting their lives at risk, but they are pressing buttons that are killing people thousands of miles away.
killing people in places where at war, like Afghanistan, but places where we're not even at war, like Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia. And we're told by our government that, well, you know, it's militants who are being killed. It's bad guys who are being killed. Well, I've been to Afghanistan, I've been to Pakistan, I've been to Yemen, and I've seen that there's a lot of innocent people that are getting killed that our government is not telling us about. This case was Manama Bibi, a 68-year-old grandmother in the fields with her grandchildren picking okra. Suddenly, a drone is overhead and she is blown to bits. Her family is left grieving the grandmother, the children, living in fear that they too would be killed by drones. This is a case of a man in, in Pakistan, got a call in the middle of the night, he was not home. He said his house had been blown up, his son and his, uh, his brother killed by a drone. The brother, a well-educated man in northern Pakistan, who went back to the village to work as a teacher because he said the Taliban were in the region, he wanted to teach the children not to go join the Taliban, that education was more powerful than weapons. And he said, what was the lesson that was taught to those hundreds of students when uh, their beloved teacher was killed by a US drone? And this is a case in Yemen, Mohammed al-Gawi, whose brother was driving a taxi, picked up strangers, as one does in a taxi. Half hour later, the taxi was blown to bits. These are the children who will never know their father again. And if you look at that man, Mohammed, what, what do you see in his face? What? Sadness, anything else? What? Anger. anger, exactly. Sadness and anger. And the anger, he said, that in his tribal culture, if somebody commits a terrible mistake or a terrible crime, they have to do something about it. They have to acknowledge what they did, they have to apologize, and they have to compensate the family. He said he can't get the United States to do any of that, not even acknowledge that they killed his brother. He said, could it be that my tribal culture is more advanced when it comes to justice than the United States of America? There are thousands of people that have been killed by these drones. 2% of them can be considered high level Al-Qaeda or Taliban. Who are the rest of them? They're either innocent people or they're low level militants most of whom have no ability, and in many cases, no intention of killing Americans. They're involved in internal struggles, and the US is going in and internationalizing those struggles, and in the process, creating new enemies. We know in Pakistan alone, there have been about 200 children that have been killed, and it's not just the people who have been killed, it's also terrorizing the entire populations because the drones fly low, People hear the buzzing overhead. They say it's like having a bee in your head. You never know when it's going to drop a missile and where it's going to land. And you always think it's going to kill you or a member of your family. And you're constantly living in fear. A woman in Yemen said she has 250,000 people in her province that we are terrorizing 250,000 people with the drones constantly overhead in our war on terror. People are afraid to go to community meetings, to go to gatherings like this. They're afraid to send their children to school because schools have been hit. They're afraid to go to funerals, and they're afraid to go to weddings with good reason. You might have heard this just happened in December, a wedding party hit in Yemen. Now, for somebody in the United States that is controlling these drones, they see a bunch of cars going down the road in a place where Al-Qaeda is prevalent. And they say, aha, that's an Al-Qaeda convoy. But they're doing this from thousands of miles away. Well, what it really was was a convoy of, of cars on their way to a wedding. And so we killed yet another wedding party. So in the use of these drones, it's not only what we are doing in the model that we are setting for the rest of the world, but it's also the fact that we're selling these drones all over the world because this is big business. Just like war is big business. Just like General Eisenhower said back in the 1950s, there's a military industrial complex and beware of it because they profit from war. And so drones have become big business and the US companies 
are selling drones overseas. Israel is the number one exporter of drones. China sees a multi-billion dollar business and says, aha, we'll produce these faster and cheaper than anybody else, and is now selling drones. And so there are now about 87 countries that have some form of drone, most of them for surveillance purposes, some of them being used for good purposes, actually. But now 10 to 15 of those countries are in the process of weaponizing their drones. And the drones are becoming smaller, and the weapons on them are becoming smaller, making it much more likely that terrorist groups like Al Qaeda can get their hands on weapons. Well, it's not only concern about those kinds of drones being used by other countries and perhaps hitting us here in the United States and how would the US react to somebody being killed on our soil by a drone. I think they would call that an act of war. But what about drones coming home to haunt us in the US? That man that you saw who's from Yemen, who you said looked like he was angry and sad, he said something very profound to us. He said, maybe your people in your country don't care that you are killing people of color, poor people of color, thousands of miles away. But they ought to care because we feel like we're the guinea pigs. And you are perfecting the, that technology on us. But that technology is going to come back and haunt you in your own country. And we know how much the NSA has been spying on us. And I know that's one of your topics. Who here is working on the NSA one? Well, that's going to be awesome. Uh, and. Um, we also know that the drone industry has forced, through Congress, legislation that says by the end of next year, 2015, our airspace has to be opened up to drones. And already there are permits that have been given out for the testing of drones by police departments. And this is one example of police department in Montgomery County, Texas. Uh, that is testing out the drones. Now this is part of a process of militarization of police departments where they have assault weapons and they have SWAT teams and they have tanks like that. This is a very scary process, the militarization of police. On top of that, to get these drones. Well, they say, oh, these drones are going to be used for search and rescue missions. They'll be used for good things. Well, it's a slippery slope because they even bragged at this press conference that they had, they bragged that this drone was designed to be weaponized. Um, one of the good things, perhaps, is the drones are still in their early stages and they crash a lot. And when they had this press conference, this drone was manipulated actually by a, uh, like a smartphone. It got up in the air and everyone was cheering and then it crashed into the tank. Um, so they do crash a lot. Now, I want to go into the good things that are happening because communities are rising up in the United States and around the world to try to do something about that. Here in the United States, there are people who want to, before we see 20 to 30,000 drones in our airspace, before we see the 18,000 police departments having their own drones, they want to put rules in place. And what's really exciting is that it's a coalition of people who define themselves as Republicans, Democrats, Independents, Libertarians, across the ideological section, a specter, even the Greens, uh, who are putting in place uh, regulations on the statewide level, because we haven't been able to get it yet on the national level. Statewide level saying, you can't use these drones to collect information on somebody unless there's a court order. Now years ago that would have seemed like, duh, no brainer of course, but in today's world that's something that we have to specify. Um, so it's exciting what's happening around the domestic use of drones. Uh, in the international use of drones, there are wonderful groups that are stepping up, protesting in front of the White House, the CIA, the, uh, the, uh, um, uh, the Pentagon, and in front of the bases where the drones are being used. In fact, you have some people right here in the front row that have been arrested in the second row. Uh, raise your hand. Been arrested where? Hancock. Hancock Air Base, which is in upstate New York, one of the places where the drones are being controlled and there's been waves of arrests. They call it a Gandhian wave and they use the, uh, they, they use the courtroom as a way to educate the public, get the press interested in talking about what's happening. Uh, protesting inside of Congress. Um, th this is, uh, uh, that's me over there. This was when John Brennan was having his hearing to be confirmed as the head of the CIA. Well, he was the mastermind of the drone program. So we thought, we've got to go in and do something about it. In fact, the, the, uh, the uh, 
banner that, the, uh, that somebody is holding up there, you see that young man's face on there? That's an American who was killed by a drone in Yemen, a 16-year-old uh, American citizen born in Denver who was killed by a U.S. drone. And nobody in our government who were standing up against the policies and were hooking up with people in places like Pakistan, like Yemen, where they are telling their governments, stop the U.S. from using these drones. And this is a picture of a delegation of us who went to Pakistan to meet with the families the, the, uh, who were victims of the U.S. drones to show that we disagreed with our policy, to be the citizen diplomats to counter the view that Americans don't care about the lives of these people. And some of the other things that we are doing to try to move US policy from one that has been this post 9-11 using the hammer of the military uh, is uh, coming together to try to close Guantanamo. And there is a group of people in the faith-based community coming together with lawyers, even people inside the military itself that say that Guantanamo is a blight on us, that we have to close it. Uh, people who are working to say, let's get all of the troops out of Afghanistan because our troops are supposed to leave by the end of this year, but there are people who are fighting to keep thousands of troops in Afghanistan. And we say, if we haven't been able in over 11 years, 12 years now, to build a stable government in Afghanistan that can defend, defend itself, we're not going to do it with one more year or two more years or three more years. It's time that the Afghan people determine their own future. Um, we are also part of that uh, a part of a, a group that is saying that the U.S. has way too big a military footprint around the world. And we are the only country that has hundreds and hundreds of bases around the world. And maybe this made sense after World War II, but it certainly doesn't make sense today. And so when we look at the budget, the bloated Pentagon budget, one of the ways we could really cut down that budget and make, make people like us better, because a lot of people are very upset with US foreign military base in their country, would be to close those military bases overseas. Um, another way that we could uh, make our foreign policy more in line with our values is to stop supporting repressive governments. Uh, this was a picture we took after the, uh, what was called Operation Cast Lead of the Israeli invasion of Gaza, in which 1,400 people were killed. And that little strip of land was almost destroyed. It was so heartbreaking to go and see what the Israeli military did there. But they're doing it with our tax dollars. Three billion dollars a year that we are giving to the Israelis. And we have been giving uh, 1.5 billion dollars a year to the Egyptian government. We did it for three decades under the dictatorship of Mubarak. And the US today, with all the turmoil in Egypt, still has way too cozy a relationship with the military in, e in Egypt that is being run now by a bunch of thugs who are going to uh, put themselves forward in elections and become the next president. Uh, and the US is also, I put a little part over there on the side because President Obama just went to Saudi Arabia today. Now Saudi Arabia, if you don't know, is one of the uh, world's lasting monarchies. Saudi Arabia, if you don't know, is a very repressive country to anybody that wants to protest internally. Saudi Arabia, women aren't even allowed to drive, much less hold lots of different kinds of positions in society. And uh, uh, President Obama went to Saudi Arabia to say, you know, we are still your good buddies. We will still give you billions and billions of dollars in arms sales. Um, we will allow you to do things like repress neighboring Bahrain, where Saudi troops went in to put down a rebellion there. So the US continues to support very repressive countries, which is not good for our national security and our reputation in the world. So, that's why I say it's so exciting that you here are focusing on how do we strengthen this muscle of diplomacy that has been so weak in the last decade. And I think we're actually in a really good spot right now to do that. Because after 12 years of war, um, 
the American people are really tired of this. And we saw it in two recent examples. When President Obama said that he was going to draw that red line and use the U.S. military to invade Syria, uh, the American people said, we don't want to get engaged in another war. And this is another example of across the ideological spectrum. It was an amazing thing to see because we had set up, a, we as Code Pink, the group that I represent, had set up a peace encampment outside of Congress. And there was, um, and we encouraged people to come. We had a big whiteboard with the names of all the Congress people that were still undecided about how they would vote. And every day we'd send people into Congress to lobby the Congress people. Well, at the same time, there was a Tea Party rally that was going on. And the Tea Party really usually doesn't like Code Pink. Um, we're sort of the polar opposites in most issues. Well, they came over after their rally to say, we want our pictures taken with Code Pink because around the Syria thing, we are totally there with you and we never thought we'd be in agreement with Code Pink on anything. Let's stop the US from getting involved in another war. And we did, we did. Yeah. And then there's the example of Iran. There are a lot of very powerful lobbies that are trying to keep us, to, trying to push for a military option in Iran, but the American people are pushing for diplomacy. And President Obama and Secretary of State John Kerry have to be applauded in pushing for diplomacy on this. So I think we're in a good place to say um, the American people are looking for something different. And I want to end with this picture of this woman here, because she's a young woman that we met in Yemen. She had been targeted by Al-Qaeda because she, as a journalist, said that religion, and especially fundamentalists, should just stay out of politics. And for that, they said it was blasphemous. They put a fatwa against her. Her life was threatened. And she went in hiding for a year. When she came out of hiding, we met her and we said, you must hate Al-Qaeda and you must like the drones because the drones are being used against Al-Qaeda in their country. She said, I hate Al-Qaeda. They're a bunch of thugs, they're bloodthirsty, they're a bunch of criminals, and I hate the drones. Because when you use drones to kill Al-Qaeda, you turn them into martyrs. And I don't want Al-Qaeda to be seen as martyrs. And you also bring more recruits and you justify the mission of Al-Qaeda. She said, in my view for a democratic Yemen, drones do not fit into our future. The future of Yemen, she says, and this is a very war-torn country, is one that adheres to the rule of law. And so I think if we think about the words of this young woman, and we think about where we are today and where we want to go, we also want to be a country that adheres to the values and principles that were and are supposed to be the founding of this nation. That we truly believe in the rule of law. That we believe in due process, that everybody has the right to a fair trial, not just be shot by something from the air. And that we, as the American citizens, are able to change our government's policies, whether it's a Democrat in the White House or a Republican in the White House or an independent or whatever, so that we can feel that when we travel overseas, we represent our country, we are representing those fundamental positive values of the United States, that when there is a problem in the world, what do we do first and second and third? Diplomacy, diplomacy, diplomacy. Thank you very much.